Focal skin and soft tissue infections are often due to bacteria infections and include conditions like impetigo, folliculitis, cellulitis, erysipelas, furuncles, and carbuncles, and necrotizing fasciitis. The first step is getting a full history. In impetigo, there's usually no pain, whereas in necrotizing fasciitis, the pain is severe. Most skin infections tend to be localized and around a particular anatomic structure. For example, folliculitis, furuncles, and carbuncles involve the hair follicle. Also, a superficial infection like impetigo or folliculitis causes itchiness. In erysipelas, the fever is high and abrupt in onset, and in necrotizing fasciitis, the fever usually persists. Some individuals have had contact with other individuals with skin infections, and this is commonly the case with community-acquired methicillin-resistant S. aureus, which causes cellulitis and furuncles. On physical exam, there may be signs of systemic illness like fever and chills, and signs of toxicity like lethargy, tachycardia, and hypotension. Additionally, there may be adenopathy, which can occur in non-bullous impetigo and cellulitis, bullae, which can be seen in bullous impetigo, and crepitus with edema that exceeds the rash border, which can be seen in necrotizing fasciitis. The rash may be papular, as in folliculitis, vesicular or pustular, like in impetigo, or there may be macular erythema, like in cellulitis. Additional lab work should be done when there are signs and symptoms of systemic toxicity. A gram stain, skin, and swab cultures can help identify a specific pathogen, like community-acquired methicillin-resistant S. aureus. Blood cultures are unlikely to be positive in simple localized infections like impetigo and folliculitis, but should be taken when there's deep tissue involvement like necrotizing fasciitis or erysipelas. Other tests include a CBC, C-reactive protein level, and liver and kidney function tests. An x-ray can be done when there's a deep infection and bone involvement is suspected. Ultrasound, on the other hand, may be used to look for evidence of an abscess below an area of cellulitis or to assess crepitus when necrotizing fasciitis is suspected. In necrotizing fasciitis, a CT scan is often done as well, although diagnosis is always made through exploratory surgery. Head CT scans are specifically helpful in orbital cellulitis, which can cause neurological deficits, proptosis or protrusion of the eyeball, deteriorating vision, bilateral ocular edema, or ophthalmoplegia with diplopia. Finally, a skin biopsy isn't routine but can be done when other tests are inconclusive, often to look for non-infectious causes. Impetigo can be classified as non-bullous impetigo, which is usually caused by S. aureus or S. pyogenes, and bullous impetigo, which is caused by toxin-producing S. aureus. In non-bullous impetigo, the lesions develop on previously damaged skin by things like insect bites or abrasions, and they start as vesicles or pustules which evolve over about a week into gold-crusted plaques that are often about 2 centimeters in diameter. Some are pruritic, and there may be regional adenopathy. The lesions usually affect the face and extremities and heal without scarring. Bullous impetigo is characterized by flaccid, fluid-filled vesicles and blisters, or bulli. These are painful, spread rapidly, and there are usually systemic symptoms like fever, chills, and malaise. There are usually multiple lesions, particularly around the nose and mouth, buttocks and trunk, and in body folds. The bulli rupture easily, leaving a rim of dry skin that surrounds a shallow, wet erosion. Unlike non-bullous impetigo, the lesions develop on intact skin and there's usually no surrounding erythema and regional adenopathy. A gram stain and culture of pus or exudate should be obtained in case it's caused by methicillin-resistant S. aureus infection. Empiric topical treatment is usually given, and common choices include mupiracin, applied three times daily, and retipamulin, applied twice daily, both for five days. Oral therapy is given to those with numerous lesions. Usually, a seven-day course of cephalexin or dicloxacillin is used.
Second is folliculitis, which is an infection of the hair follicle, and it's most often caused by S. aureus. Superficial folliculitis is when there's a tender or painless pustule with the hair shaft in its center. Usually, multiple lesions develop anywhere there's hair, like the scalp, armpit, or groin area. Other symptoms include pruritus or tenderness, and the pustules tend to heal without any scarring or follicle loss. A gram stain and culture should be done to identify the causative organism. Treatment is not always necessary because mild folliculitis with few pustules often resolves spontaneously. If there are numerous papules or pustules involving a large body area, then topical antibiotic therapy like clindamycin 1% lotion or solution can be used twice a day. Severe cases may require a systemic antibiotic like dicloxacillin or cephalexin for a week, and chronic recurrent folliculitis may require daily application of a benzoyl peroxide 5% gel or wash. Third is cellulitis, which is an infection of the connective tissue, and it's usually caused by S. pyogenes and S. aureus. In cellulitis, the margins are hardly noticeable because the process is deep underneath the skin. Adenopathy and symptoms like fever and chills are common. Although cellulitis occurs mostly on the extremities, it's particularly worrisome when it affects the eyes. Orbital cellulitis involves the contents of the orbit, mostly the fat and ocular muscles, and it causes pain with eye movements, proptosis, and in some cases, ophthalmoplegia with diplopia. Preceptal or periorbital cellulitis affects the anterior portion of the eyelid without involving the eye, and it tends to be milder. Generally speaking, cellulitis can also be worrisome if it extends into deeper structures. It can lead to thrombophlebitis, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis, as well as development of an abscess. Additional tests are recommended when the individual is febrile and appears toxic. Blood cultures should be performed to identify the bacteria and bacteremia. Usually uncomplicated cellulitis on an extremity is managed with outpatient antibiotics like cephalexin, dicloxacillin, or cloxacillin. If fever, lymphadenopathy, or constitutional signs are present, then IV oxacillin can be initiated with a plan to complete a 10-day course of oral antibiotics once the individual is stable. If the individual looks severely ill, then IV vancomycin can be given to offer empiric coverage of methicillin-resistant S. aureus. If there's an abscess, it may require surgical drainage. In orbital cellulitis, hospitalization and IV vancomycin and cefotaxime are usually indicated. And all individuals require CT imaging of the orbit to assess the extent of the inflammation. If there's evidence of an abscess or sinus involvement, then surgical drainage may be required. For preceptal cellulitis, empiric oral antibiotics include trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or clindamycin, along with amoxicillin, amoxicillin clavulanic acid, or cefpidoxime. Fourth is erysipelas, which involves the deeper layers of the skin and the underlying connective tissue, and is usually caused by streptococcus pyogenes. Classically, erysipelas affects the face, but it can also occur in other areas like the lower limb. The affected skin is swollen, red, and very tender, and there can be superficial blebs. The characteristic finding is a sharply defined, slightly elevated lesion border with reddish streaks of lymphangitis. The onset is usually abrupt, and there are often systemic symptoms like fever and chills. Treatment includes IV cefazolin or ceftriaxone with a plan to complete a 5-14 to 14 day course of oral antibiotics once the individual is stable. Fifth are furuncles and carbuncles, which are usually caused by S. aureus. Furuncles are infections of the hair follicles which can begin as folliculitis, but then involve deeper layers of the skin, or they may arise as a deep-seated tender parafollicular nodule. Carbuncles are groups of furuncles that develop in the same area. Furuncles and carbuncles may occur in any location, but often occur on the lower abdomen, buttocks, and legs. Lesions are typically indurated with central necrosis. Furuncles usually don't cause constitutional symptoms, whereas carbuncles are often accompanied by fever and can lead to bacteremia. 
Treatment for furuncles and carbuncles includes regular bathing with antimicrobial soaps containing chlorhexidine and wearing loose-fitting clothing. Lesions can be drained by using a hot, moist compress or by draining lesions with a small incision. When lesions are numerous, IV antibiotics like cloxacillin or cefazolin are recommended. Sixth, there's necrotizing fasciitis, which is an infection of the deep soft tissue that destroys the muscle fascia and overlying subcutaneous fat. Necrotizing fasciitis can be polymicrobial and often involves Clostridium perfringens or Streptococcus pyogenes. It commonly involves the extremities, particularly in those with diabetes and peripheral vascular disease, and it progresses rapidly. It can evolve over hours, leading to systemic toxicity, limb loss, and death. Initially, the tissue may be red, but then can quickly cause severe pain, fever, and crepitus, with the overlying skin developing into patches of red-purple. Over the course of a few days, the skin can break down and bullae can form, over time developing areas of gangrene. The diagnosis is established with surgical exploration and it needs to happen right away. The goal of operative management is to remove the necrotic tissue and leave behind only healthy, viable tissue. For a severe necrotizing infection involving the extremities, amputation may be needed to control the infection. Intraoperative specimens should be sent for gram stain and culture. A CT can often help confirm the diagnosis, and two sets of blood cultures should be obtained before starting antibiotics. Lab work includes a CBC, electrolytes, creatinine, BUN, liver function tests, coagulation studies, creatine kinase, lactate, and ESR and CRP levels. In addition to early and aggressive surgical exploration and debridement, broad-spectrum empiric antibiotics should be given. For example, meropenem or piperacillin tazobactam plus an agent with activity against methicillin-resistant S. aureus like vancomycin plus clindamycin for its antitoxic effects, which can be effective against toxin-elaborating strains of Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. Finally, IV fluids and vasopressors may be needed to provide hemodynamic stability. Specifically, albumin replacement may be required in the setting of capillary leak syndrome, which is associated with streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. All right, as a quick recap. In non bullous impetigo, the lesions start as vesicles or pustules and evolve into gold-crusted plaques, often 2 cm in diameter. They usually affect the face and extremities and heal without scarring. Bullous impetigo is characterized by painful vesicles and blisters or bullae that spread rapidly. Topical therapy with antibiotics can be used for local infections, but systemic therapy is needed for severe cases. Folliculitis results in discrete, dome-shaped pustules that involve the hair follicle of the scalp, buttocks, and extremities and improve with topical antibiotic therapy. Cellulitis is an infection of loose connective tissue and it manifests as an area of edema, warmth, erythema, and tenderness with barely visible lateral margins. Orbital cellulitis affects contents of the orbit leading to pain within eye movements, proptosis, and ophthalmoplegia with diplopia. Periorbital cellulitis is an infection of the anterior portion of the eyelid. Treatment with IV or oral antibiotics is usually empiric, and if there are abscesses, then surgical drainage may be required. Next, erysipelas involves the upper dermis and superficial lymphatics of the face and the lower limb. The skin in the affected area is swollen, red, and very tender, with a sharply defined elevated lesion border and reddish streaks of lymphangitis. Erysipelas is usually managed with empiric antibiotics. Furuncles are deeper infections of the hair follicles, and carbuncles are groups of furuncles. Prevention includes regular bathing with antimicrobial soaps, and treatment sometimes requires surgical drainage. And finally, necrotizing fasciitis is an infection of the deep soft tissues that results in the destruction of muscle fascia and overlying subcutaneous fat. It most commonly involves the extremities, where it might debut with local anesthesia. Then, the infected area gets red, edematous, and individuals also present severe pain, 
fever, and crepitus. The diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis is established with surgical exploration of the soft tissues, which is also when surgical debridement is performed. Treatment consists of empiric antibiotics and hemodynamic support.